All right, we are here at the United West Studios behind the scenes on uh, a, uh, a very unique day, uh, August 6th, 2021, 10 years since all of our lives changed in many respects, but mostly this guy right here, um, Billy Vaughn, and our special guest uh, who a couple of years later got involved in a very dramatic way and has, and has impacted the, uh, the importance of what occurred on that day, August 6th. 2011 in Afghanistan. Um, this is a very informal look. We just wanted to come together with some thoughts. So I have to stop and ask the producer, are, is everything okay? I'm fixing one. Okay, <laughs> he's good. He's good. All right, but we have to we have to check that. Uh, Don, how you doing? Don Brown. Doing great. Uh, it is a somber day, but I'm glad to be with friends. Glad that you guys are my friends and counting my blessings. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, somber. I mean, all of us, it's an emotional day in many respects. But, uh, you know, in terms of the valor, the uh, the, the commitment, um, the hard charging nature of, uh, of these 30 boys, <laughs> men, um, it's a day to, 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 to honor them and, and to be proud. It's a day to be proud. Uh, August 6th should be a national holiday as far as I'm concerned, and it should be named in honor of these guys. I know they wouldn't want to talk was to take off work uh, like most other federal holidays, but it should be a national holiday. As, as our friend Sean Hannity has said, every American, every American should remember and understand what happened on Extortion 17. Every one. And thanks for your work in helping to get this out, Tom. Yeah. And our purpose today, just a few minutes together, is not to go through your book uh, the cover up of the shoot down of extortion 17. It's just kind of to reflect a little bit. And, uh, we have uh, a gold star parent with us, Billy Vaughn. Um, uh, Billy, take a minute and, uh, share your thoughts with Don and anyone else who may be watching. So, yeah, it is, uh, <clears throat> this is the 10th anniversary. Uh, this past June 24th, Aaron would have been 40. Uh, so in a lot of ways, this, this, this is a big one. They've, uh, they've all, they've all been, uh, they've all been big since obviously the first one was the biggest and, uh, um, it's been a long road that's led us where we are today. I, I, it is a summer day and, and, uh, but, uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to, uh, express my love for the, the Sicilian <laughs> and, uh, he surely has become uh, one of Karen and I's uh, uh, greatest supporters in, in the early days. Uh, uh, just had a lot of guts and a lot of nerve and introduced us to a lot of people who have helped us a lot. And uh, we've, over the years, we have been in, introduced to some people that obviously our son had not lost his life. We'd, we'd never know. And the room is actually has a, has people in it that who have supported us a lot and including Don. And I remember the first time that Don called me and uh, uh, he didn't have a clue what I had in my possession. <clears throat> and uh, it was even, I think it, Don, it was right before my book came out, I believe. It was supposed to come out in October of that year. You called me that summer and we probably talked an hour on the phone. And, uh, uh, you know, I love Don today, but that day I was very suspicious. He was a Navy JAG. A retired Navy JAG from North Carolina, a you know, purple state at best, you know, and I'm not uh, sure which part of that makes you suspicious. Probably all of the above. All of it, all of it. Uh, he did talk like a southerner, which kind of makes me, you know, uh, give Here we in, go. Give Here in we go. a little Here bit, you know. But I know they're like. But anyway, no. And then, you know, we became we became good friends, just like just like Tom and uh, uh, Don has. Uh, I would say that. I would say that, and Don, you can agree or disagree. I could. I would say that me and Don Brown and and Karen have more information about this than anybody, and uh, we know when we hear something. Most of the time, if it's bull, or if it's if it's got something to it that we that we need to look into, and we've looked into a lot of things that have been fake, and we don't talk about it until we find out if it's got some validity to it or not. And uh, I appreciate that about Don. Hey Don, take um, take a minute. Now you're you're a trial attorney, so you can do things in a minute. 
take a minute to, to give uh, everybody watching um, a chronology, a timeline of August 6, 2011 and today. Today is the 10th anniversary of our loss, largest loss of life in the Afghan war, largest loss in the history of U.S. Navy SEALs. Shot down on a helicopter called Extortion 17, or does the military cause an Extortion 17? This, this flight was flown in the early morning hours um, out of Logar province into Wardak province, Afghanistan, under questionable circumstances. It should have been a 10 minute flight routine, according to the military. Takes off at 2.22 a.m. Uh, six minutes later, we still have contact with it. After that, we lose contact. Should have been on the ground at 2.32 a.m. We can't raise it on the radio. It seems to be hanging in the air. Um, we, we get strange signals from the pilot when we do we do re reach it again. And it just at 2.39 a.m., just before 2.40, it blows up, shot out of the air, blows up out of the air, hits the ground. And uh, the tragedy begins there, but so does the cover-up. And uh, military has, uh, the Pentagon, I should say, I don't want to say the military, my son's in the military, and I don't want to swat the entire military with the, you know, with the, the woke generals and admirals that run the Pentagon, but they've hidden and covered up. They've lied to us about what happened to the black box, which had a cockpit voice recorder. We know what went wrong. There were Afghans on board this chopper. The American people didn't know about that. Should never have happened. We found bullets in the bodies of several Navy SEALs that were thrown away by the pathologist. Billy and I have been to Washington, D.C. trying to get answers. The Armed Services Committee gets to run around for the Pentagon. So if, to me, there, there are two tragedies here. First off, the loss of these guys and our nation's failure to recognize who they are and what they stand for. And secondly, it's the inexcusable cover-up. That's, that's kind of the case in a nutshell. You know, neither this film nor any book can cover the entire thing. I do think this film is going to be a step in the right direction and bringing some life into this story. So um, as you have done also, Tom. Yeah, and the film is displayed behind us here. Uh, Fallen Angel, Call Sign, Extortion 1-7. And right now it's playing, and today's obviously uh, August 6, 2021. It's playing on uh, www.salemnow.com. Salemnow.com. And you can go there, free to subscribe. And then it's very obvious, it's right there. It's their feature playing. I think there's a $20 rental, get four or five, have a watch party. Roger Gangitano called me, he's having a whole bunch of people come in to watch it. People are doing that. So um, do that. Go there, spend 20 bucks, watch the thing, and um, you'll, you'll get an overview of the story. This is one of those stories that isn't going to go away. I mean, it's a cover-up of the Obama administration. Sooner or later, we're going to dig and dig and dig, and sooner or later, people are going to come out. They're going to feel that I need to tell the truth. And they're going to tell the truth about this thing. And hopefully the military changes to move in the right direction. I think you said something on Hannity the other day regarding sending kids to war. What, what were you talking about? No, it was on Fox and Friends. Uh, Fox and Friends, yeah, right. Yeah. I just said, you know, I mean, we, we, this is a 20-year-long war, 20-year-long 20, 20 war, the longest war in our history. Uh, you know, I've heard uh, senior military officials say we're managing this war instead of trying to win this war. And, um, you know, I, I think it's fair to the American people, to the citizens of this country. I think it's fair to the men and women who, who volunteer and who, who run to a fight that, uh, that uh, leaders, both, both in the military and in government, have their back and do not put the United States of America in another war unless you intend to win it. You, ha win it. you have to understand, uh, uh, you know, government leaders, your credibility is way at stake way at stake when you when you know we don't trust you on anything anymore i mean you could tell me the sun rises in the east and it would give me reason to doubt it if it came out of their mouth you know? <laughs> amen to that well on, on august 6 2011 uh i was a guest speaker at an event a, a tea party remember the tea party mm -hmm. tea party in deland florida and um mark who's behind all the machines and everything yeah, <laughs> the Muslims were par learning how to parachute. Well, that's not a bad thing in Deland. Yeah, um, and uh, nine o'clock in the morning, I get up and there's there's news. Helicopter went down in Afghanistan. Special forces. I go, what? How do they, what is going on? So a couple hundred people downstairs went downstairs. I said something weird is happening. Um, uh, something bad. We need to pray. We stopped. We prayed. I, I did my presentation. 
And then uh, Ann Lindholm, who was with us, worked with us at the United <laughs> West, starts crying like crazy. And then Mark starts crying like crazy. And they're both crying. I wonder what is going on. Well, Ann's uh, husband, Ray Lindholm, was um, uh, with the 75th Rangers. And he flew extortion 16 and 17 a lot with the SEALs. He was a dog handler. When she heard a dog went down, they had that information very quickly, which was very strange. When, when she heard a dog handler went down, she thought it could be her husband. And then Mark was trying to console her, and he starts crying, and everybody's crying. And that started. That was 10 years. You believe that? 10 years ago today, that happened. And then we have three other guys in here, Ronnie Wexler, Jack Gillis, and Barry Fernandez. All of them got very involved. Ronnie, we went to Israel and put a, a memorial uh, at Yarnin, right, um, the, the baptismal area. Ronnie Wexler was able to get the Israeli government to plant a tree and put a memorial there for Aaron. <clears throat> Jack, you had uh, all kinds of stuff with us at uh, uh, Tea Party Fort Lauderdale, and Barry's on your board with Operation 300. He's been in the middle of this. So we came together as a family for Billy, who usually doesn't come out on, on this day, um, to just uh, recognize the guys. But Don, you never met, none of us ever met Aaron. And um, from what you've learned, this is a military story, but it's also a human interest story. From what you've learned about Aaron, share your thoughts as to what kind of guy you think he was. Well, first off, I've been I've been I'm moved by the stories of his faith in Jesus Christ and his, his belief in God, his his love for his country. Um, that's at the core of who Aaron Aaron was that I haven't met, but we'll meet. And and the other thing, he was he was almost like a superhuman. I mean, when you stop and think about it, this guy had um, he played football, he tore his knee up. He had ACL, as I recall. Billy can, can fill it in better than me, but, you know. But then, despite this debilitating injury, decides he wants to be a Navy SEAL. Okay, comes in, goes to <laughs> signs up for the SEAL program, goes to Buds, goes through Hell Week on a bum knee, and is able to excel at the most rigorous military training in the world. Hang on, hang on, hang on, <clears throat> hang on, hang on for the audience. This is not a lawyer with hyperbole. This is a naval officer who spent a good portion of his life in the Navy, and he's talking about the SEAL team. Go ahead. I'm a naval officer first uh, and always will be. And so this guy, uh, you, you know, is if you just read about him and if you know that about him, and of course, I, I don't go into that in my book because it's primarily on the investigation, but I think Karen and Billy mentioned that. But this guy, Aaron Vaughn, is... Uh, if there's a superhero, that's Aaron Vaughn and uh, and what he stands for, what he stood for and continues to stand for, even as, as he's crossed over onto the other side. Uh, you, you know, the impact that he's had now on thousands and hopefully soon millions will never be forgotten. And I, I'm just so grateful for what Ronnie did and in, 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 in that setting up that memorial in Israel. And I find it ironic that the Israeli government <laughs> seems to have done more to give honor to these heroes, all of them. Aaron is not the only hero on board that chopper. Every one of them are. Aaron just was incredible because he had to overcome so many odds. But it's ironic the Israeli government seems to honor these guys more than our own government. And I totally agree with Billy. At this point, anything that comes out of the deep state, that they're lying to me until proven otherwise. But Aaron, I can't say enough about him. I, I, I can't wait to meet him. And uh, I, I wish that every American had half of what Aaron Vaughn has. We wouldn't in the problems we are if they did. That's for sure. By the way, let me say this about Don. I said a while ago, and I didn't finish it, about the Navy JAG, and I was suspicious of him. The reason why, <laughs> reason why I said that is because I, I, I do love our military. and uh, but, but at the time Don called me, Karen and I were having problems with the Navy and uh, because we, we had started talking about things that uh, didn't make sense, asking a lot of questions. And uh, so, so I was suspicious when a, a lawyer – uh, from the Navy. From the Navy, <laughs> yeah, right. He's calling me that time, wanting to know what I knew, you know, so anyway. But hey, I'm the government. Right. I'm here to help you, you know. Um, all right. <clears throat> Thank you, Don, for your uh, your reflections on, on Aaron. And you're right. There were 30 Americans there, and um, all of them, obviously, heroes. Uh, Billy, uh, share the father and a son relationship. So... Um, 
you know, obviously uh, a mom has a different relationship than a son does. I thought Aaron and I always had a good relationship. I believe we did. Uh, Aaron was uh, Aaron was always uh, he wasn't a perfect boy, but he was very respectful to his parents, and uh, he was he was always uh, very very careful to not dishonor the family name. I mean, he just was from the, from the time he was a small boy. And uh, uh, one, uh, you know, a couple things about Aaron that since he since he passed away, as Don said, he was a believer. He was he was not just a believer; he was a fierce believer. Aaron Aaron was he he loved the to protect the innocent. Uh, he was he was passionate. He was humble, but he could be so fearless at the drop of a dime for injustice anything that took place and and he would it's just like you flipped a switch in him and he was that way since he was just uh seemed to be a small boy but but when Aaron died uh you know we knew he was a believer uh and you know sometime I would talk to him and he'd call usually in the middle of the night when me and his mom were fast asleep in bed Aaron would call wide awake you know hey hey what are y'all doing you know and and uh We'd talk, but sometimes I would ask him, I said, son, are you, are you reading the Bible? Are you reading God's Word? Are you praying? Yeah, oh, yeah, Dad, yeah, Dad. And, you know, that's the same thing that I, I would have told my dad and mom when they, but, but, when, but, when, but when he died, uh, it, was, it was amazing uh, how many of Aaron's uh, seal buddies and even his chaplain at Devgrew uh, told Karen and I at different times uh, uh, what a, what a what a, a Christian, what a believer, what a warrior for Christ he was. In fact, one of his, I'll never forget the statement, one of his uh, buddies said uh, Aaron was a, he was a light for Christ in a dark, dark world. And uh, his, his dev group chaplain said, uh, told, told us that if I had five men like Aaron Vaughn, I could conquer the world. And uh, then just... About three years ago, uh, another one of Aaron's closest friends, they lived together in uh, San Diego on Coronado. They lived uh, when they were in SEAL Team 1, and uh, Eddie Gallagher and I were together out there one night when Karen and I were in California for some speaking engagements. We got together with some of Aaron's friends, and, and Eddie and his wife, uh, Andrew, were there. And uh, for the first time, I guess, ever, Eddie and I had a lot of time to talk one-on-one. -on -one. And, uh, you know, I, I asked Eddie how he was doing, and... and it, you know, he told me that he he and Andrea were in church and they, they were serving the Lord and and he he brought it up to me and I, I, I hesitate to even say this, but it impressed me so much that uh, first of all, Chief Eddie Gallagher would say this to me, and that second of all, this is the impression that my son had left. But uh, Eddie said, uh, "Billy, you just you just can't realize how much Aaron loved you." And he said it was just uh, so amazing. Said. Uh, We'd be sitting around talking, and he said he just talked about his dad all, all the time. And you know, uh, I'm just like all other dads. I was never perfect, never even close to it. You know, God gives us a lot of grace about the mistakes that we made with our kids. But to think that my kid, uh, Navy SEAL, but my boy, you know, still thought that much of his dad, you know, when uh, we were so far apart, it just... Uh, it just meant a lot to me. It just really did. And he was the same way with his mom. So respectful. Always just so quiet that, uh, you know, when, when parents, you know, when we do things that may not even, especially me, you know, may, may not even be, uh, you know, your dad, you know. You, but uh, Aaron would, uh, he, just, he just wouldn't come back at us. You know, he was, so... Lovely boy. Wait, 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 wait. You need a hug? You need a hug? <laughs> Let me give you a hug. Amazing guy. Men like Aaron Vaughn do not grow on trees. They don't come about by half and chance. Aaron Vaughn was raised the right way, but a guy sitting beside you, Tom, by his mama, too. And he is he is the best of them both. And uh, And they, Billy and Karen, have made a huge difference, both in raising that young man and training him and teaching him bravery and teaching him audacity and in carrying on his legacy afterwards. So they're heroes. They're not only great friends of mine, like a brother and sister, also heroes to this country. And they mean so much 
they're among our most prominent goal store parents. And I know they're both tired, and I've told Billy and Karen they're very, very tired. It's been an exhausting journey, but their mission is not over yet, not far from it. No, it's interesting you say that. <clears throat> In the early days when it happened, um, I, I live <clears throat> about an hour south of where these guys live, and it was on the news all the time, local news, your 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 mother was on the news all the time. And um, <clears throat> it was announced there was going to be a memorial service. I think it was the 25th of August, 2006. And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to go up there. Um, I have a cousin who's a legendary SEAL from the early days, and we have been involved with the SEAL community. And Aaron was a SEAL, and there is a, a, a brotherhood there. So I went, figuring a couple hundred people. <laughs> uh, it was in a high school auditorium was that what that was there's was 2000 2000 people there and i've never seen so many um full dress blue seals uh in one place in my life you know they all were wearing the trident and it was just an amazing uh ceremony and um, uh, video of his life and all of that and i said this this is a special guy i mean this is an amazing guy to pull this many people out so um you know, what are you going to do? I mean, it happened, and uh, we're all going to go that way at some point uh, where we stop breathing. And if we could impact a tenth of the lives that Aaron has, you know, glory to God, that would be it. Um, so anyway, just wanted to get a, a, together for a little bit, share some thoughts. We have, a, we have a live audience here of people that have been involved in this. You guys want to say anything or got any questions or anything? Just come over here. This is very informal. One of the stories that you don't hear enough is right the uh, is the the one about is, a, is about the eyesight. Can you tell that yeah. story? That, that's an incredible story. Yeah. So 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 uh, Aaron was uh, right-handed. You know, shot like a right-handed person. Uh, you know, and and his his right eye was his. Uh, was his side eye, so to speak, and uh, sometime during training or something, he had gotten lasered in that eye and damaged that eye. And in fact, you his know, right been, eye. Yes. Oh. He had he'd been told that he would probably, you know, lose at, at some point the sight would get worse and worse. But before he went to Team Six, he, he had to he 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 trained himself to begin to use this eye uh, at that age, at you know later in life like that, and uh, you know he he just. He switched over because he couldn't. He 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 was he was just you know overcome whatever. Just amazing whatever man, is, and yeah. and and you know I'm sure there's a ton of them like that. But like Don said, his doctor said he couldn't even play sports anymore. You know, and uh, and so he overcame that, and he overcame that uh, the. Uh, he didn't have an ACL. The, the, yeah, he, was, he, yeah, he, he, he he didn't have an ACL, and uh, his. Uh, but there were other things his mother could tell you about. You know, I mean, Aaron. He by the time he got killed. Listen, and I'm, I'm, I'm not saying anything special about our son. I'm telling you, I've met a lot of these guys who have worked like they've worked. Some of them are very good friends of mine, and these guys have fought a war, and our nation's leaders should be ashamed that they've used Navy SEALs and, and, and Delta Force and, and SEAL Team 6 like they've used them many, time, many times running multiple ops, uh, ops in one night. And this is out right out of the mouth of seals. They they land, and they get the info. They do a, they do an op, and the info they get, they're sent to another one. Now listen, this is what these guys are trained to do, and they love it. But you know, you don't use a thoroughbred, except when you need a thoroughbred. You know. So, but we we have done hundreds of hours on this and these issues and all of that, and we we we've dissected this thing a million different ways over. 10 years. Um, and if you want to know about that kind of stuff, there's, there's at least three good books out there. Don Brown's book, the cover up of the shoot down of, uh, extortion one seven call sign extortion one seven. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that's the movie and, um, your book betrayed betrayed, which is, uh, an analysis of the, the failure of the, uh, Obama, the, what is it? What did you call it? Barry? Biden. The Obama, yeah, Obama Biden administration, and your wife really wrote a book about your yeah. son. What was that? World changer. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, a world changer. Mm -hmm. So the audio book, so, really the audio book <laughs> was taped right here where we are right now, right over there. <clears throat> Mark taped 
your wife reading it in her audio voice. So, but what we're doing now is very informal. Just wanted to get together, share a few thoughts. Yeah. And, but but uh, Mary's question does need to be answered. What was Mar Mary? Ask your question, please. Yeah, I wanted to ask uh, because the the movie is talking about the uh, black box and how the black box was either not there or was there, and you've got proof that it was there. Was it ever found? Mary, uh, that's a great question, and. Anybody within the earshot of my voice, please see this movie. Please watch it. Do it. You know, it's a patriotic duty to honor these guys. But the question, the back black box is raised there. And I'll answer the question. I believe it was found. I believe it was found. The government has acknowledged, has not acknowledged it. I believe that it was found on the ground that morning. I can't prove it a thousand percent. I believe it was found before U.S. Army Rangers arrived on the scene. The official court report said the first group of Americans on the scene at 4.12 a.m. was U.S. Army Rangers from the 75th Ranger Regiment. And we interviewed some of those guys in the film. However, we know beyond any doubt, in my opinion, that there was an unidentified coalition force that came onto the crash scene. After the chopper went down at a little, a little, a little before 2.40 a.m., after it went down, and, and follow up, as a follow-up to that, then subsequently began to stay on the ground for a period of some 40 minutes before it was, before they um, left. And they left, they left uh, the scene some 20 minutes before the Rangers arrived. We don't know who they were or why they were there. But we discovered, and I put it in my book, from something called Enclosure H, that they were there. We have two sources. Both the Taliban reported it on radio traffic. Now we discovered that the fire support officer for the Aviation Combat Brigade confirmed they were there. And subsequent to that, we have found uh, Apache videotape where we've heard the Apache pilots talking about them being on the ground. Mary, I believe that somehow, some way, they got that black box in that interim. There's no other reasonable explanation. I don't know how they did it. The chopper was on fire. It's possible the black box was kicked out of the chopper. But we know the Pentagon has get, first given us different stories and flat out lied about this black box. We know there's a black box. Please look at the film and you'll see why. We've got pilots that will tell you it was there. And we knew it anyway. We sent pathfinders looking for it. And that, that, that black box, Mary, contained a cockpit voice recorder. And I, and I believe something went wrong on board this chopper. It, I, I frankly believe was probably infiltrated by what we call green on blue. I, I believe the circumstantial evidence points to that. Why else would you be hanging in the air seven minutes after you should have been on the ground? And that's why I've had several prominent interviewers, other than Mr. Trento, who's my favorite, but I was asked by Sebastian Gorka and, and Dennis Prager the other day and others, you know, why would the Pentagon lie about this? But why would they lie about it? Why would they hide the black box? Because they do, it's a political embarrassment. If something went wrong on a chopper, it's a major political embarrassment. So back to your question, I believe it was recovered. And I know the Pentagon lied about it. They have not admitted to recovering it. We need to continue to demand answers on that. And I love to hear that cockpit voice recorder. I believe that cockpit, that cockpit voice recorder, if we had it, would solve 99%, not, maybe not all of it, but it would solve at least 90% of the mystery of what happened to these guys. On. I'd like to add a little bit to that. There are actually, a, 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 uh, you said two sources. Um, I'm going to name the sources that we have. We have Enclosure H in the chronological time of events. We have the Taliban radio intercepted by coalition forces telling when the uh, people, the co uh, unidentified coalition arrived. We have the interception of the Taliban radio by coalition forces telling when the unidentified force left. We have the Apache helicopter pilots, as you said, talking to each other about when they arrived and when they left from the gun tape. And we have the Pentagon in an email saying that Enclosure H is their official uh, chron chronology of what took place in the shoot down and what happened that night. And we have, I have, Karen and I have, an individual that I can see his face right now as plain as day that was introduced to us in Michigan by friends in, in the military who brought us there to speak that came up to us and told us he helped guard the black box. So the, so I would give his story as much weight as I give Gary Reed's. 
if Gary Reid can say what he says before Congress, this individual, who, by the way, was asked if he would interview on camera, and he would not, and I don't blame him, uh, but uh, this individual has seen and helped guard the black box until it was carried away. So uh, if I'm to believe this guy that I know, the black box was found. And I believe him. And, and for the sake of viewers going black box, uh, the black box usually isn't black. It's usually orange. And it has a, um, a signal thrown out of it that you can find it in an ocean a mile deep. So it isn't like you're scrounging around in the woods for a black box. Yeah, Mark, you had something? Can I can I just say one one quick comment? You know, I I am so thankful for Billy and Karen and Don for keeping this story alive and for getting the information and getting the factual information out to the American community because we needed we need to know the facts as well as the families for closure. So thank you, Billy and Karen, and thank you, Don. Thanks to the United West team also. Let, let me let me take. Let me tell you something else. Thank you, Mary, very much. Let me tell you something else that just came up. Uh, wait, wait, Mary's ahead. been in this yeah. from day one. Yeah, she has. You were there, I think, weren't you? Yes, I was in Deland as well with you and Ann and trying to figure out what we needed to do to help Ann through it. Mary, yeah. let me let me tell you something else that it just and it's funny. It just came up again this this last Sunday after the uh, after the premiere on Saturday night. Uh, Joni Marquez was at our house on Sunday afternoon. And we were talking, and I told Joni, and and I believe it. And in fact, who was Joni? What did she do? Captain Joni Marquez. She was a fire fires officer on AC one thirty. That was overhead watching yeah. everything. And I told Joni as we were talking because uh, Joni, one of Joni's, you heard her on the on the video. I wasn't on the uh, film. I you know I, I failed at saving their life that night. And and they they her and Nick. Uh, Sergeant Nick Moore both said, uh, you know, there was no reason for a QRF. There was no reason for – nobody in the world can figure out a reason for a QRF. Well, let me just tell you this. It wasn't a QRF. The mission – the SEALs were doing a standalone mission, and I, I, I believe that as much as I believe anything, that, that this sense. floor is green and there is proof of it. And even Joni, when we – she and I talked on Sunday, and we were talking about these things, Joni brought up – she said to me – well, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. She said, because we were trying to give them a landing zone, and they were saying to us, we've got these landing zones that we've already picked out. And she's saying, right. how? Wow. We're saying on the plane, how come they already have landing zones if this is a QRF? And let me tell you what happened. Just two days ago, we had uh, the ballistics uh, We had the ballistics uh, guy in the movie. Uh, he called me, and he wanted to see the redacted file. And so Karen was sitting there last night, yesterday afternoon, or, or, or maybe the, it might have been, it, I guess it was two nights ago, and she, she, she was trying to pull it up on her computer. She pulled up a, something that we had that immediately came up that, you know, she thought might be it, and it came up. It was a 52-page report from the Colt Report, but she said, you're not going to believe this. And Karen and I had read this report before, but we're just parents. First time we read it, first time we went through it, it took somebody like Don and other people like that and General Boykin and 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 uh, Dan Gordon and people to point out to us things that we didn't recognize, but, but we know a lot more now. But anyway, what it said was right there, a redacted name was testifying to uh, Brigadier General, uh, General Colt, and he said, yeah, we... <laughs> We've been looking at some spots for a couple couple days before the raid, and we picked out some landing zones, and then there were questions about that. And then the last and final thing that I'll say about that is I know a man. Don knows him. Don's met him. I introduced him to him. He met my son in Afghanistan. And by the 3rd of August, Gold Squad was talking to this man about a mission that they were planning. And uh, it was a mission that uh, this man later was supposed to be involved in. And on the, on the Friday of August 5th, while the Rangers were planning their mission, Gold Squad, you remember, they're both on Fob Shank. Gold Squad was planning their mission. The ideal time for them to launch their mission this is now, now everybody out there that might be a military expert understand this is coming from an old man from Tennessee who's not in the military. 
But I do, I have had 10 years to figure things out, piece of information together. Every day, every day. Joni said this statement in an interview that she did with, I, uh, with Karen and I a couple years ago. She said the Rangers had already asked to be exfilled. Mm-hmm. That meant the radio signal went out, come and get us, extortion 1-6 and 1-7, because they had delivered the Rangers. That was also the radio signal to Gold Squad that our mission is time to launch our mission. And they went out and got on extortion 1-7, and they thought they were going to be dropped off as the Rangers were picked up. That's my opinion. There's that's too, the reason Joni had multiple landings. That's up. right. That's too many, too many things point to that. There's too much. I'll just, there's too much evidence that point. And another thing, seals usually do missions with four, five, three, six, or seven, not seventeen, yeah. not seventeen seals, two cryptologists, four EODs, and uh, I mean, you know, where were they going? They wanted to put a doing? force on the ground too, Billy, because they because they didn't go in with one because they, they figured if they go in with two choppers. That, that it takes longer to get the field, the, the group in there, so they, they're going to go in one chopper. Right. They're going to yeah. boom, throw them all out there. Well, and you, hit you heard Nick say that was risk assessment yeah. to get them all on the ground immediately, you know, and that, that's quite a force. And if you add the seven Afghan commandos in there, that's uh, you know, you you've got you've got quite a fighting force on the ground. So it wasn't a regular uh, uh, SEAL operation. Well, I wanted to bring. In- Go ahead. Oh, good. Mark, but anyway, the, Mary, the, thank you. No, go ahead. So you Mark, and then we'll, then we'll close. <laughs> um, real quick, um, one other point about the black box, circle back, is I did the research to go look for the maintenance records of Extortion 17, and I found that they just they just did file a file FOIAs to get file the FOIAs maintenance reports. Maintenance reports. Who, who did? Who I did. did. Oh, you just filed FOIAs. No, okay, no, I thought five years what, ago. What, oh, okay. Well, well back yeah. ago, and yeah. I found out that it went through a major refit. The, uh, you know, the the super duper refit that all choppers have to go through, through after a period of time. It just went through that, which means it's got the latest and greatest equipment, black boxes, not just black boxes. They oh, had yeah. the latest and greatest equipment. So that. And by the way, Mark, just to add to that, one of the pilots talks about that refit in the film um, Mm -hmm. and probably the same refit that you're talking about, about the upgrade of the communication system, including the black box system. It's not just it's not just black box. It's 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 a you know, they strip it down to its bare bones because it's been in the sand. And so they have to read and says, well, as long as we got it all here, let's put all the latest, greatest thing back on it. And so that's what they do. So there's it's not just the black box. It's every little, you know, whiz bang thing that they have right now. Every condition, and yeah, and we were getting the email, the the letters from them, and then we would ask another question, and then all of a sudden it stops. Uh, we have no further information anymore on this. We we'll just stop. It doesn't that. have a black box. That's a bunch of crap. One one other thing. One other. Th- Go ahead, Don. Th- th- think for a moment about the ridiculousness of Gary Reed's. Who is Gary Reed again for our viewers? Here? Gary-, Gary Reed was the Deputy Secretary of Defense who testified for the Pentagon. In February of 2014, before Jason Chaffetz's committee, they were asking questions about the shoot down. Gary Reed, after the military or the Pentagon had claimed that the black box washed away in a flood, changed that story two and a half years later for the first time, telling Congressman Chaffetz, well, it never had a black box to begin with. These old CH-47s don't have a black box. Now, think about that. (laughs) The most powerful, advanced, sophisticated military in the world putting its most elite unit in the world on a chopper without a black box it, with, with a military that is financed by the world's greatest superpower. How believable is, believable is that BS? If, if, if Biden would have been president, it would be somewhat <laughs> believable. But he was not president at that time. He was almost president. <laughs> if, if that were the case, you know, any commander in chief that allowed our military you know, to fall to that state should be impeached. This case is either criminal negligence or absolute, or either criminal negligence or a deliberate setup. One or the other. It can't, it's got to be one or the other. It can't be anything else. Don, I have another question for you. Okay. And this, this is something that's always. We've got to wrap it up. I know, I know. Soon. Yeah. Got to get going. Really and I've got a statement I got to make too. Really quick. <laughs> and this is a thing that's really, really bugged me. All right. And it's not in the film, not because it's not in the film, but it's bugged me from day one. Okay. They, they, you have the largest military disaster of Navy SEALs in history. It is, it is, it, you're going to bring in the best 
the absolute best crime scene investigators and and the mo- and the and the best you know reconstruction thing and everything top notch FAA NTSB the whole nine FBI everybody's coming in there to look at this right is that what happened Don? What happened was a joke and a cover up. They they didn't want the truth out. Um, and I'll say that, and I'll defer to my buddy Billy. I want to make sure he gets the statement in. Well, I was going to say one other thing about uh, Mister Mister Miko Donald Miko. Who's that? He's he's the ballistics expert oh, in the oh, film. Right, 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 right. And he appears in the film. Yeah, he appears in the film. Right. What what you didn't what you didn't know what didn't come out in the film about Mister Miko is is he's he's not just a ballistics expert from Atlanta. He's the ballistics expert. Him and his crew that worked on the Pat Tillman case, that worked on the Nadal oh, wow. Hassan Ford oh, case, really? wow. and uh, and he his crew was brought uh, the rotor from from supposedly from the chopper and asked his crew to look at that and and asked to look at a I believe a a uh, uh, an RPG motor, but when his crew asked, "Do you have any guns and bullets for us to look at?" <laughs> They were blown off and not offered any, not given any. He, 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 they actually asked to see the ballistics, which would have cleared up a lot of things about the bullets in the bodies, and uh, they weren't allowed to oh, see Oh, you, you guys haven't talked about the bullets in the bodies at all. No, This was supposed to be a different story. Uh, 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 <laughs> Look, you have to go, But you don't throw bullets in the body away, guys, right. okay? <laughs> you have to go see. It's back here. We'll put it up. Uh, Fallen Angel, call sign extortion, 17. You can go to uh, www.salemnow.com, streaming service. Just sign up. It's for free. Then they're featuring this uh, extortion movie. It's 1999. Watch it yourself. Get a couple of people. Then buy the three books. Don's book, a cover-up of the shoot-down of Extortion 17. Billy's book, Betrayed. Go on Amazon for these. And then World Changer about Aaron Vaughn by Karen Vaughn. Get the audio so, version. Yeah, no, no, no. So anybody want to say anything before we leave? Ron, you want to say anything? Or anything? Jack, anything? All right, Billy, I'm going to give and, you And the, what, what, Biden is not president, by the way. <laughs> the, pres- the president is right here in Palm Beach County in exile. Right? A- too, amen, Billy, amen. Not too far from here. Mary, any uh, concluding thoughts? No, I'm just uh, thankful that this story is is still being uh, told. I'm thankful. I'm I'm saddened when I watch the movie, but um, what a, what a great tribute to to the heroes that were SEAL Team Six. Yeah, Don, your uh, your concluding thought. We remain on a mission to uncover the truth, and this great film is part of that. Do yourselves a favor, get a watch party, throw it on a big screen and pray that justice and the truth comes out and that uh, justice will prevail. And we believe that it will. Well, we have another lady here who I think wants to say something. Um, The uh, Bart who was on uh, Extortion 1-7 went down, um, but the the community gave uh, Billy a little gift, Billy and Karen. And we have a female here by the name of Mitch. You know, that's from Mitch your Rao. book, Mitch. Rao. Mm-hmm. Does she want to make an appearance? Does she want to make an appearance? Come here. Come here. Bring her over here into the camera. Bring her up on your lap if you can. Uh, Come here. Come on. Get up here. Come on. Well, come on, Mitch. Female on the lap. Wait a minute. What? Uh, she's cool. She's, she's been in here before. Get up here. Maybe you can see her head. Can you see her head? Get up here, Mitch. No, can't see her. All right. Yeah, she, 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 she's done about all she can do. That's she, about she, it. She's going today. She's a, a mutt. Is she a mutt or what? What is she? She's a Belgian Malinois. <laughs> that's, that's a she she she's, is the Navy SEAL of dogs. Yep. Yeah, yeah, she is. And she's fully trained. And uh, Billy has. Be another book? Follow up with new information? We hope so. We're working on it. Oh, right. excellent. And Billy, uh, your concluding thoughts? I'm, I'm done. Thank you all. You're never done, dude. You're never thank done. You, thank you all very much, all of you all of you in this room. All, what I will say is I have a very diversified group of friends. <laughs> so anybody that ever says that Southern rednecks are prejudiced, just look at my friends. A Cuban-American, a Sicilian-American, a Jewish-American, you know, and, whatever an American, is, and a Yankee-American. And, a Yankee and so all, all, you know, we're, 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 we're and her up there. Well, you're a, you're a Michigander. northern, yeah. no, northern southern. She's right? a Michigander. Uh, yeah. uh, huh? What'd she say? She's a Michigander? A French Canadian. French Canadian. Oh, no. Get out of here. Oh. <laughs>
On that and the note, foreigner. On that note, we're done uh, here and um, go right. to the United West and uh, whatever. Yeah, so, bye. see you. Goodbye.